Welcome, welcome, welcome. We're back. Podcast number two of the 2022 season. We are talking week zero. Week zero ball is over. That's weird, but I'm glad it's over. I don't know. I was, you know, I was glad it happened. It was fantastic. Nebraska, Northwestern friend was fantastic from Ireland. Uh, we ended the night in Hawaii, as all nights should end somehow, some way, um, and everything in between. That was fantastic. Once again, Scott Roussel joined with college football experts Zach Barnett, John Bryce. Thrilled to have you, gentlemen. Let's start in Ireland, Northwestern Nebraska. It was everything we all wanted. Well, unless you're a Cornhusker fan, it was everything we all wanted. I loved every second of the game. Thoughts? Yeah, I mean, uh, it was everything uh, the rest of us wanted. It was everything Nebraska fans feared over the last nine months. It's the different cast of characters, same problems. Same uh, same song, different verse. Three turnovers. I mean, the, the one, the fumble. The Nebraska was looking like they're going to make it 21-10 and this, their anti-clutch gene of if there's an opportunity opportunity to screw up, they'll find it. Three turnovers and basically a fourth turnover with that horrible onside kick when you're up by 11. I mean, you basically four turnovers and you can't stop the run and you're not going to win. And that's what happened to Nebraska for what is it, the seventh time in a row? I saw the stat there. First team in FBS history to lose seven games by seven games in a row by seven points or less or something like that. Like it's maddening if you're a big red fan. Yes. Yes. Seven games in a row of single digit losses. I think they have one nine point loss thrown in there, ZB. But um, yeah, I mean, it was the nightmare scenario for, for Nebraska. If Nebraska had played just terribly and been thumped by Northwestern, um, at least it would have been a different narrative. Instead, it's this is a Nebraska team that's now, I believe, five and twenty-one in uh, single-digit games under Scott Frost. Here, one game into his fifth season, uh, complete nightmare scenario for them in that regard. Uh, the onside kick will be looked at a lot. I I really applaud wanting to play aggressive and sending that message to your team. You better be darn near certain. It's going to work, especially in that environment. You were up 11 in the second half. I would have almost preferred to see that onside kick tried earlier in the game when you also had an 11-point lead at 14-3 to to really potentially deliver uh, a complete knockout blow at that point. Instead, you set Northwestern up on a 44-yard field. The Wildcats score in five plays. Nebraska never scores again. Shut out over the game's 24 final minutes. Um, and here we are just talking about the fact that Scott Frost, we wrote about it. He was already answered. If things continue to go bad, would he consider resigning? We're that's after that's at three 30 in the afternoon on the week zero Saturday, guys, we talked about how insane it's been the last couple of years, but three 30 on week zero Saturday, we get our first true hot seat question. It's insanity. I do want to say, Shout out to a longtime friend of mine, Mike Bajaki in the Northwestern OC. I thought he called a really good game. I thought the announcers were a little unfair uh, late in the game about him being overly conservative. He just hung 31 on Nebraska after Northwestern struggled so mightily last year on offense. I thought Bajakian had it dialed in. I thought that they played the game very smartly down the stretch and put it all on their offense in the trenches to win and then trusted their defense that they would win. And it was a great recipe for Northwestern. So I thought, you know, they get the ball back with like 520, 530 maybe, backed up, and they, they produce a couple of first downs. And I'm sitting there with my 11-year-old, and I'm explaining to him, I'm like, this is like a five-minute offense. If you can just run the ball, like if you get five first downs, you run the clock out, you win the game. And we're talking about that, and then they're down to like 230, and maybe it's a, a second and long – third and long and they run run fairly conservative and exactly what you're talking about you know there there were some people going gosh they were really conservative there and I honestly think that was Fitz saying hey guys we got acres who is going to put them on the one that was unbelievable and then the defense is playing fantastic like and Nebraska is going to Nebraska and Fitz played the odds and he won yeah, no, I, I completely, completely agree with that. We, we talked about it a little bit yesterday afternoon as it was unfolding. And, and again, I, I applaud that move. I typically um, am not, fa- in, not in favor of that kind of conservatism. But you force Nebraska to burn all of its timeouts. You've got already Nebraska in its own head about how many times it's been in this scenario and failed. 
And then you got a guy who's out there hitting a lob wedge and dropping them at the three. I mean, it was best case scenario for Northwestern, the way that game unfolded. And it was Northwestern saying, hey, we're going to be physical. We're going to out physical this team that that talked about how many times their offensive linemen were puking. And then, by the way, thanks to you, Scott, we got to see one of the great opening salvos of college football (laughs) weekend on Twitter. I'll, I'll let you share that. Uh, Northwestern's O-line coach just had a little fun on, on the Twitter after that. That's all. Anyway, my wife did recognize that college football is back when I'm screaming at the linebacker. It's like, I don't know, a minute 40. Uh, gosh, second down, third down. Nebraska catches the ball over the middle. I'm like, tackle him. Just tackle him in bounds. Tackle him in bounds. They miss the tackle. The guy gets out of bounds. Clock stops. I was like, you got to tackle the guy. It was College football is back. It was a moment. Was a Nebraska happy. defender missing a tackle. Where have I uh, – that, that... No, no, this was Northwestern. Okay. Defender. This yeah. was to tackle the, the Nebraska ball carrier, get him down the ground. Clock would have run down like a minute 20, minute 30, yeah. and then they've been inside a minute on the next play. Blah, 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 blah. Anyway, Northwestern got the win. I was happy for Fitz. Uh, Nebraska, I just – don't know, guys. Don't know. All right, rest of the day, uh, Western Kentucky – Eventually got it growing, took care of Austin P. I'm excited to see what Western Kentucky does next week. We'll talk about that in a second. UNLV handled Idaho State. Uh, UConn put up way more fight than Utah State was probably wishing for or expected. I don't know if you guys got to see some of that. I got to see some of that. UConn looked okay. They looked much better coached, to be honest. Yes, that was that was obvious to me. They looked like they uh, had r- r- real coaching with real playing. Great. Uh, I mean, it looked like Jim Mora – you know, has definitely made the most of the the nine months or whatever it is that he's been there. And they looked like, I mean, I, from the last time we checked in on them, which was uh, what la- last September, uh, they looked like a completely different team. So, uh, you know, you don't want to take credit for you know a moral victory in this sport, but uh, UConn looked like a much much different team than than last year. Yeah, what I saw out of UConn was, was discipline and fundamentals, and also the early forming of belief because they had a couple of chances in that game. Uh, early on to maybe say oh here we go again and instead they battled through all four quarters and and that's what a coach in in year one game one is especially looking for yeah all right so florida state handled duquesne good job guys Mm -hmm. uh illinois handled wyoming i think illinois has got indiana coming up in week one which is a weird thing to say but interesting uh, FAU put it on Charlotte eventually. Um, you got, I think I got to see early on in that game. I didn't see much past maybe the first quarter. You guys get to see much of that one? I didn't see a lot. I saw a little bit. Um, Charlotte, I think, has is, is got some obvious um, gaps to fill on offense right now. Not a lot of offensive identity um, seemed to rise to the surface in that first game. And, um, you know, it's big years for uh, Willie Taggart down at FAU, and it's a big year for Will Healy at, at Charlotte. And, one of those guys got the start he needed, and the other one did not. Yep. Yeah, good game by N- Nikosi Perry, the FAU quarterback, the Miami transfer. Um, going to uh, dovetail into something we'll have this week. I'm doing a study on just FBS starting quarterbacks and how many transfers. And I think we might see over half of FBS starting quarterbacks did not are not at the school they signed with out of high school. So definitely a trend to keep an eye on. Yeah, real life. Nevada eventually – Found a little bit of a groove. Ken Wilson gets the first win there, which is uh, awesome for him. Congratulations. North Texas, UNT, Zach, your guys pulled it out. Yes. Uh, you know, first of all, uh, they had a packed house at the Sun at the Sun Bowl. First time since, I think, 2008. Uh, they, the, the game was delayed for a uh, – they had big weather in there, which you don't see often in El Paso. But it looked like the crowd stayed, which is great to see. And uh, UNT played great defense, and Austinani didn't turn the ball over. So that that's going to be the winning formula for them this year. And they uh, they won pretty comfortably in El Paso. So a great start for Seth Luttrell. So what are they now uh, since the middle of last season, uh, Zach? Aren't they six and one or seven and one at this point? Six and one, correct. Six and one in their last seven. Yeah, after a right. really uncomfortable start. But yeah, so yeah. yeah. We'll see yeah. how you keep it going. All right, Vanderbilt uh, looked like a different team. Hawaii looked like a team that's kind of been decimated by the Todd Graham era. Uh, JB, you got thoughts on Fanny Hawaii? I do, I do have uh, a lot of thoughts on that one because um, I was crazy enough to stay up till the very end of that game uh, out on the island, and it was a it was a late one that ended. I want to say maybe around one thirty or so. Um, Mike Wright looked really good at quarterback for Vanderbilt. Just a um, a really splendid performance 
by him. And Notre Dame, I mean, excuse me, Vanderbilt on both sides of the ball. I'm thinking Notre Dame because of Clark Lee. Vanderbilt on both sides of the ball, offensively and defensively, looked so much faster than not just at any point a year ago, but really looked so much faster than any of the final two to three years under Derek Mason. I thought it was really impressive how the Commodores look. They've got a couple of new weapons on the offensive side of the ball that have some real jets to complement Mike Wright. And then I, I told you guys I was going to drop this nugget. So Vanderbilt scored 63 points last night. Guys, they did not score their 63rd point last year until the second quarter of their fifth game. And I believe, by the way, um, showing a little uh, segue here, I believe that game was against UConn last year. So they did not reach 63 points until the second quarter of the fifth game of the 2021 season. They had 35 points in the third quarter alone last night, which I think was more than they had in seven games last year. All right, so quick story, then I want to segue to week one games, and we'll do some rapid-fire stuff. So playing in Ireland, northwestern Nebraska, the stadium loses internet. Hence, they can't process uh, vendor sales transactions. They can't process beer sales. So somebody there makes the absolute right call. Everything's free. <laughs> Literally, everything was free. Anybody walk up and say, hey, give me may I have nine beers. May I have a couple hot dogs? Can I have whatever else they sell in Ireland? And it was free for everyone. And they sold out of everything. I live in Baton Rouge. I was trying to process in my head if that had happened in Tiger Stadium. And I think it happened. I think it happened early in the game. How quickly Tiger Stadium would run out of alcohol. It, it's... It's mind boggling. I mean, can you guys imagine that? It would be within it would be within ten real minutes. The, <laughs> if the word would pass, hey, free beer, and it'd be gone in ten minutes. What I would and, like to know would be the uh, the per capita expected consumption between a stadium in Dublin, Ireland, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana, because I think those would be some pretty, pretty heavy numbers. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it, it would be fascinating to know. How many, like how much alcohol, you know, like per fan, per capita, per seat, each stadium stocks? Uh, yeah. Yeah. LSU and Wisconsin are probably top two if we're talking FBS. So does Wisconsin sell it in stadium? I can't remember. I don't, I don't know. I'm just assuming that they do, but yeah, exactly. Yeah. Everybody should. Why not? Good fun. All right. Week one. Week one starts in just a couple of days, Thursday, Thursday night, right? Uh, some actually. Very good games Thursday night, I believe. So, yeah, West Virginia. I'm going to hit some of the headliners. Gentlemen, I'm going to go rapid reaction because it's early. Just give me some initial stuff. West Virginia at Pitt. Close line. Should be a fun game. Entertaining game. You know, it'll be like real rivalries in week one. This is fantastic. Yeah, this, is a, this is a matchup that's great for college football. One of those that should be played every year. The backyard brawl. Um, Pittsburgh trying out a lot of new pieces after winning the ACC a year ago. Um, and, and having a chip on their shoulder, I think, this week, this year. Um, and then, obviously, an incredibly make-or-break year for that West Virginia group. Yeah, new coordinators, new quarterbacks on both sides. For, yeah. so hitting, hitting the road sprinting in week one. Year two of Heupel in uh, Tennessee. They got Ball State. Any thoughts on Neyland? Yeah, I mean, it should be a, a runaway for the Vols. They just got uh, USC transfer wide receiver Brew McCoy declared eligible on Friday, but they had, they had anticipated that. I've talked to people throughout uh, training camp and they've also been working him as their number one wide receiver opposite said Tillman. I think the key thing that Tennessee people want to see early on is how much has the defense improved? How much can the defense improve? We know the offense is going to go at a big tempo under Josh Heupel, but this team will go as its defense is able to improve or not improve. Yep. Penn State at Purdue. Exciting game! Like uh, I, I think Purdue wins. I, most people are going to take take Penn State. I'm going to take Purdue. I think Purdue. Uh, there's a long, long history of those Big Ten East teams struggling on the road at the Big Ten West. So give me a upset pick, Purdue. That's an impressive upset pick. If we're if we're launching our picks calendar this coming week, <clears throat> I can't wait to see that. So oh, we are um, launching it. We're not yes. launching it right now, but we're definitely launching it. This right. Week. That that one's that's an interesting one. I love what the Big Ten is doing this weekend uh, with the way they're staggering games. I give them tremendous credit for having uh, Penn State 
Purdue early. You've got uh, Indiana, Illinois on Friday night. I think there's mm-hmm. a couple of other uh, good matchups in there, interest conference. And then you've obviously got in primetime Saturday night the big game as well. So I really, really give Big Ten schedule makers a whole lot of credit. There are there are some outstanding matchups this whole weekend. I'm fired up, just like what you're saying. I'm going to transition this to Friday night. Uh, early Friday, we got Virginia Tech, Old Dominion. I think that one has uh, the potential to be a good football game. I hope I'm right. We'll see. Um, I think Pry's fantastic. I think he's going to be really good long term. He's got to put the pieces together and, and see how they come together. Typically, year one's not that easy. We'll see how it goes. Ricky Ronnie really had a struggle. Um, just had a offensive coordinator change mm-hmm. from the guy he hired. You know, not that long ago, just made a change there. That's strange. We'll see how that goes. Um, Temple Duke is an interesting chance. A to game stay. that is happening. Yeah, yeah, it's a game that's happening. It'll be, yeah, it'll be something. Illinois, Indiana feels like the headliner uh, of that night. I think it, you know, should get a lot of eyeballs. No, oh, I got, I got TCU, Colorado. That's coming, that's coming later. That's a late night. That's a, that's you a. Call, but it's, it's my headliner. That's the game I'm really looking forward to. And Temple Duke is a, is a sea change for both of those programs. First year head coaches, TCU obviously a first year head coach now, and then Carl Doral uh, in a really key situation going into this season at Colorado. So again, love the way the schedule sets up this opening weekend. But but TCU Colorado is it for me. But I love watching games at Colorado anyway. It's just a great thing. It's stunning. It's absolutely beautiful. TCU Colorado is going to be the strongest, you know, most watched game. But in the seven o'clock slot, I'm excited about Illinois. I'm excited about the whole night. It's a great. It's a. Whole, it's Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. All right, let's start early Saturday. It's the first game on the quote schedule. You look at Sam Houston at Texas A&M. Zach, is there any chance Sam shocks him? No. <laughs> no. There's uh, Sam's a, a very strong program moving into uh, moving into Conference USA here soon. But, uh, no, the Aggies have too much, too much talent. No, no chance. I'm going to disagree with you on the no chance. I'm going to say you got to okay. see the fight that's in them. I, I don't know. I'm just not going to write them off. I'm writing them off. I'm writing them off. I'll, I'll say this. Um, you want to talk about some uh, unruly message boards. Let Texas A&M on the heels of what many people believe is the greatest recruiting class ever and the offseason war of words between Jimbo Fisher and Nick Saban. Let Texas A&M even struggle with Sam Houston State and uh, Tex Ags and all those message boards are going to be lit. It would be, it would be incredible. It would be fun to watch. All right, same early uh, time slot. We got North Carolina traveling to Boone, taking on App. Uh, North Carolina should be able to handle that, but I love seeing I love seeing them going on the road to play one of the uh, the the younger siblings in the state. I think that's that's awesome. Good on you, UNC, for for playing this game, and I'm sure it'll be I'm sure it'll be lit in Boone. Yeah, Boone is an Boone is an awesome place. A great college town. Uh, that's a sneaky tough game for uh, UNC Agreed. for sure, and and there have been some some pretty heady teams go into Boone and, and lose their way in recent years. So that's when I guarantee you, I, I agree with Zach. It's great for the sport. It's great to keep that revenue in state. I promise you, Mac Brown and that coaching staff are like Bubba, Bubba Cunningham. What are you doing to us? <laughs> week one. I know it's our second game, but week one. Yeah. All right, Oregon is at. Well, I was playing Georgia effectively at Georgia, but it's in Atlanta. It's going to be a fun one, huh, boys? Yeah, I mean, Dan Lanning has, has played it close to, the, close to the vest. He's not going to reveal any sort of starters. Uh, I think that, to me, leads like he's playing tight. I say, Dan, go out and play loose. Like, no one expects you to win this game. Just play loose. Like, you, you use your advantage. The, you know Georgia – more intimately than any opposing head coach, you've got nothing to lose. They're, they're defending national champions at basically a road game. It's your first game as a head coach. Just go let it all hang out and have fun and let the chips fall where they may. I mean, it, it, if, if you lose by 7 or 17, or no one's going to think any differently of Oregon. So just go out there and, and let it all hang out. And I ultimately think that that's what Oregon will do. I've been really impressed with um, what we've seen out of that camp, <clears throat> the Oregon camp over the course of this preseason practice and just the way that Dan Lanning has carried himself. But in terms of <clears throat> being kind of secretive and playing it close to the vest, come on, guys. He's been under Nick Saban and Kirby Smart. All he knows is secretive, close to the vest, awesome. paranoia. Don't let anybody see practice. Don't let anybody know what's going on. That's, I mean, 
that's ingrained in his DNA. All right. I got a great game for you. Cincinnati's at Arkansas. Great huge, games. Huge yes. Potential here. Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I'm really interested to see what Cincinnati has. I know a lot of, they lost a lot from last year. Uh, no one is expecting them to repeat in the playoff, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not writing Cincinnati off here. I think they can go in there to to Fayetteville and make it really, really interesting, even with a lot of a lot of new players in, in important spots. I'll say Cincinnati benefits from the fact that that's a, a 3.30 afternoon game instead of a primetime game because they would not uh, want those denizens to call the Hogs all day long and have to play that game at night. But, look, no Desmond Ritter, no Jerome Ford. Uh, no more Sauce Gardner on defense. A lot of, lot of holes. Cincinnati's going to be fine this year. I don't think it will be fine this week against Sam Pippen and the Hogs. Zach <laughs> drank queso last year because UTSA had an outstanding season. UTSA opens up at home. They got the Houston Cougars coming to town. Zach, what, what do you put on the line for, for this one? I'm putting nothing on the line, but the Alamo Dome should be, uh, should be close to full. Houston – has a lot of that uh, Cincinnati expectations this year as the top group of five team. Obviously, UTSA is coming off that conference championship game. This is not one that – for our listeners, keep this one in, in your uh, clicker rotation. This is going to be a really good game, really heated, uh, interesting week one non-conference game. And we real quickly, last year we talked about it maybe being the year of the defensive coordinator, uh, and we saw guys like a Dan Lanning, like a Marcus Freeman, uh, like Brent Venables all ascending into the head coaching roles. The next one of that group, Houston's Doug Bell. The guy's an absolute star. He's been on our watch list. Um, so he's a, he's a fun subplot in this game for me to watch um, because he's a stud. So there's so many games we can talk about them all. I'm going to throw this one in there. Typically might not be on everyone's radar, but Nebraska is at home, and they got North Dakota coming to town. Everybody goes, oh, that's FCS. They're a good FCS program. Uh, Scott Frost does not want to struggle here, and I think he's going to be in for a massive battle. Just something to have eyes on. Yeah, North, North Dakota has been a, a playoff fixture. Well, we skipped over one when we talked about those FCS teams to pay attention to. South Dakota State at Iowa on Friday, I think, is a sneaky, sneaky good game. When we saw South Dakota State go in last year and really handle Colorado State and initiate the, the downfall, the complete mm-hmm. end of the Adazio era out there at Colorado State. And um, Iowa's a, a better coach team, more fundamentally sound and large but South Dakota State will not be bowed by them. Uh, you say the Adazio era and just, <laughs> just – oh, my gosh, that happened. What a, oh, what a bad hire that was. Um, hmm, sorry, that just threw me off completely. One of those things. All right, we just don't have time to go through all the games right this time, but now you get down to Utah in the swamp. Let's go, baby. The whole country's fired up about this one. Yeah, yeah I mean – Oregon, you go in there with nothing to lose. Utah is going to Florida with everything to lose. Like they got to win this game to make the playoff. They got if if it's going to, if a if Utah does not win this game, it's going to be really hard for any Pac-12 team to make the playoff. I mean, it's kind of a, a lose lose because you're the defending Pac-12 champs taking on an average Florida team with a brand new staff. But if Utah can go in and into the swamp and win, that would be great for that program. Obviously, great for that conference. Uh, should be a great quarterback battle between Cam Rising and Anthony Richardson. Um, and it's – I have the numbers somewhere in my brain, but it's the first time Utah's played in a pack, or in an SEC stadium in like 30-something years. Like, this is a game we've been – that's like multiple decades in the making. Uh, you guys know in our first podcast of this 22 season, I already started talking about Utah-Florida last week. It's the game outside of Notre Dame-Ohio State that I most anticipate from this opening weekend – um, I'll slightly disagree with you, Zach. I think if they, if Utah loses this game and goes 11 and one and then wins a Pac 12 championship, they won't be penalized for a week one game on the road in the SEC at a, at a program like Florida. Um, but, but certainly they need the equity that would come with a, a week one win. But we, we've got the picks coming this week, and I'm telling you boys right now, I am heavily leaning on picking the Gators. Billy Napier was able to take a Louisiana team 
in and win at Iowa State when they opened the year ranked number nine, and those those guys dominated that team. I realized that was not a year one team for Billy Napier, but Billy Napier um, has an incredible organization. I love the makeup of his staff, and he knows how to thrive in these environments. I really am leaning towards the Gators early on and just think that um, – the, the swamp is going to be insane for them. They've sold way more tickets than they'd sold the previous five years. I want to say season ticket sales are up for them for the first time in a long time. I'm, I'm leaning the Gators heavily at this point in time. So my caveat to that is I think the last time a Pac-12 team went undefeated through their conference schedule, I think was like Chip Kelly's Oregon teams. I'd have to look that up. But I'm baking in a Utah Pac-12 loss at some point, and there's no way a two-loss Pac-12 team is ever getting in. That's fair. That's All fair. Right. All right. I'm, I'm going to keep us moving along. Utah State, you know, kind of struggled a little bit with UConn. It's because they got Alabama coming up. Were they looking ahead? Were they holding back? My guess, honestly, is they were holding back a, a, a significant amount of their package because they knew Nick was in week two. Utah State have any shot to, to no. sneak up? No, Not a, no. UConn ran all over them. And uh, Alabama might have Gibbs, the, the Georgia Tech transfer, one of the best running backs in college football. All right, moving on to a great, great week one matchup. Notre Dame, Ohio State. Let's go, baby. I can't – I mean, this is – we'd have to be in the conversation of is this the most juiced week one game? I mean, considering everything, the the programs, Marcus Freeman's connections to Ohio State, I mean, Ohio State's national championship aspirations, I would be – if you would say this is the biggest week one opening ever, I wouldn't argue with you. Yeah, it's um, it's a big one for sure um, for all the reasons you outlined there, Zach. Obviously, the official onset of the Marcus Freeman era, yeah. even though he coached the bowl game. Interesting to note that bowl game was against uh, – even though he'd left, it was against the blueprint defense that Jim Knowles had installed at Oklahoma State. Now Jim Knowles, one of Zach's 15 best hires of the offseason – is at Ohio State. So there is some familiarity there for Notre Dame facing an off a defense that it just faced in the bowl game. Um, obviously, I'm based in South Bend. I've been around that program a lot. Um, there's a there's a quiet confidence in this Notre Dame program in the building that they can do some things on both sides of the line of scrimmage to make this a fourth quarter game that comes down to execution. But there's a, there's a lot of belief. Um, there's a lot of authenticity in the Notre Dame program right now that I give tremendous credit um, starting at the top with Marcus Freeman, but then the way he empowers his staff, it's really phenomenal. So big time game, a tough, tough order, especially for Tyler Buckner to be making his first ever career start at quarterback on the road. Um, but Notre Dame believes I will tell you that right now. Memphis at Mississippi State has the potential to get weird. That excites me. I'm here for that. It got weird last year. Remember, the, the, the officials blew the penalty call and the a kick went back for a touchdown that should not have happened, and that was a stunning early season loss for, for Mike Leach and the Bulldogs. I don't see that happening this time whatsoever. SMU, North Texas, Zach. Uh, I, SMU tra traditionally uh, – Handles North Texas pretty well. Uh, I, 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 I'm going to take that as well. I think SMU wins that, wins that game. Zach, Texas beats Monroe, let's just say, by 40. Texas is back? Oh, my God. <laughs> Next. <laughs> hey, uh, Louisville-Syracuse Louisville is a game I'm looking forward yeah. to this weekend. And it's a game, obviously, uh, with mega implications for the head coaches at both of those programs. But – Let's see what kind of progress both Syracuse and Louisville have made in the offseason. Um, a lot of changes to both those staffs. I know um, Satterfield has brought in Lance Taylor to help run his offense at Louisville. Um, really bullish on Lance Taylor's uh, upside in his career. Um, they got the quarterback back, but they lost some key playmakers, um, including the wide receiver to Alabama. So um, how do they retool? But that's a sneaky, compelling game to me. I'll tell you, the last three games in the schedule Saturday night are just unbelievable bonkers potential. So Boise State, Oregon State could just be 50 to 48. Kent State, Washington, nobody knows how that one's going to go, and I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Western Kentucky is going to go try and hang 90 on Hawaii. I don't know they'll do it, but there's going to be points scored, and it's going to be great fun. 
Yeah, we saw um, Western Kentucky needed just about all the points they were able to hang on Austin P last night. Scotty, Waldy, Scott, Scotty Walden's group really came to play and uh, gave WKU some fits. And this is WKU program trying to sustain the success that it had last year with Bailey Zapp and Jareth Stearns, the, the dynamic wide receiver and quarterback combo. Where does WKU go this year? And what can Hawaii do to start getting its footing under Timmy Chang? After a uh, long sleep Saturday night, Sunday morning, the CFB gods will grace us again with college football Sunday night. Florida State LSU in the Dome in New Orleans. Scott, how excited are LSU people for this game? Like, is it going to be is it going to be packed, or is it going to be one of those neutral set games where there's only like fifty thousand people there? Well, it'll be no, it'll be good, and it'll be strong lean LSU. Uh, I would not tell you I feel so. I live in Baton Rouge. I would not feel like there's this massive excitement about that game being in New Orleans. Uh, there is a lot of excitement about the game. There's a lot of excitement. Hey, we'll see how Brian's going to do. Um, you know, the quarterback thing. We'll see how that plays out. It's it's a whole new staff, and there's 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 building excitement. Um, they just they need to see it. So hopefully, I mean, if the game were in Baton Rouge, it would be bonkers. It would be fantastic. The atmosphere would be amazing. I think in New Orleans, it would be reduced a little bit. Um, the tailgating is just different. On campus LSU is is an experience. In New Orleans, is New Orleans. You got everything available to you, but it's not like a tailgating traditional scene. So we'll see. It'll be great fun. I'll, I'll be happy to have college football Sunday night. And then we got Monday. We got Clemson, Georgia Tech. Jeff Collins. Man. But, mm. Yeah. New I, new coordinators uh, on both sides of the ball at Clemson. Um, and Chip, uh, Chip Long now pulling the trigger for Georgia Tech. Uh, really compelling matchup. Chip's got some familiarity with Clemson from his time at Notre Dame. Um Man, my make or break year for Jeff Collins, and everybody knows that. Um, but it's a chance where all pressure in that game is on Clemson, especially with Clemson opening the season ranked number four in all the polls and, um, you know, trying to prove that they that last year's 10 win season, which most programs in America would gladly take, was just a minor blip for the Tigers. So there is pressure on Clemson in this game. Yeah, it's Wes Goodwin. I mean, uh, he's their their new defensive coordinator. Dabo promoted him from the off the field staff. Like he, I mean, he's been around, but he's never been an on field position coach in his life. And now yeah, he's coordinating Clemson's, you know, maybe the best defense in college football. On offense, you got Brandon Streeter, who's a longtime program guy, been promoted, you know, from within. Uh, you know, I mean, Dabo's doubling down on himself really by promoting from within, and. Um, Excited to watch that. And DJ Uyunglele, if I said that right, uh, can he hold off Cade Klubnick at quarterback? So you, you've got some uh, Kelly Bryant, Trevor Lawrence vibes at Clemson again. Yep. The football gods grace us this week, Thursday through Monday. Just a smorgasbord for all to enjoy. Yes. How great is it that college football is back? Yeah, and we and we grace with a second podcast – out of the week zero of slate of games. And we're uh, committed to me making this thing two to three times a week moving forward. So I love that. And I, for as long as I can, last thing, I'm going to wear as many different random t-shirts as I can. So the first one was Milligan football, which said undefeated since 1950, because after the 49 season, Milligan had to cancel its football program. So I love that t-shirt that they sell t-shirts that say Milligan football undefeated since 1950. Today I got the creamsicle bucks. Who knows what's coming next? And our boy Dougie Samuels, one and zero, off to the yes. right start. Yes, yes. I think they play Gold again. This Thursday. We'll update again before then. All right, go, All right, Gold gentlemen. Blooded. College football is back. Football Scoop Podcast is back. Like us, rate us, share us, subscribe, do all those great things. Tell your friends. Tell your girlfriend. Tell your wife. Tell everybody. Tell your kids. It's great to have everybody. We'll see you on the website and on Twitter and everywhere else in between. Go enjoy your Sunday. <laughs>